Well, the news today should cause you to probably be excited. There seems to be a link to autism, and you'll never guess what it is. Well, today I'm going to update you about something that actually is a little close to my heart. You may think to yourself, well, why am I talking about autism? You know, I usually talk about COVID-related stuff. But I'm expanding the health principles because I have a unique way of looking at medical and scientific research. And because I've had an insight into autism, my sister uh, has always been into special education. So I always heard the stories about autistic children. And I realized very early on that there was something quite unique about this. And so I have never looked at it as a, a mental um, handicap, so to speak. I think it's just because of how the society is at the present, re present way, why they, we tend to think of it that way. So I'll share with you some ideas because it depends on the severity of the autism as well. But I will share with you the update from Marty McCary, Dr. Marty McCary, who is the FDA commissioner, and he was doing an interview on GB News. News. And so he was making some points that I think are worthwhile for you to hear. And then I'll come back and share with you some of my insights from what I have looked at in terms of autism research. So let's listen to what they had to say with regards to the Trump announcement yesterday. Tell our viewers and our listeners and my panel what the findings are about autism and the connection that might exist with, between that and what we would call paracetamol. Well, thanks for having me on. We have a massive autism epidemic. You know, it's gone up 500% in the last several decades. It was rare a generation ago. You just didn't see people with these repetitive motions and tics and completely nonverbal. You still don't see it in anyone over the age of 60. And so what's going on? Something is happening. And so we did an extensive evaluation of the research. We found a couple plausible mechanisms and we felt compelled immediately to let people know as we discovered things. Posing you right here. It, it's important to note that the politics behind this is there was an announcement earlier in the year from RFK Jr. that they were going to find the cause of autism by September of 2025. So they had to say something. And I think that what they have done is tackled one of the low-hanging fruit, so to speak, an easy political win something that indicates a trajectory of not being uh, afraid of asking difficult questions. But anyone who knows the background will know that fundamentally, the question is leading towards whether or not high amounts of uh, children's vaccines are a contributing factor to autism. At the end, I will probably share with you my own view based on what I looked at in the science. But let's listen a little bit more to what he had to say. And one of those things was that autism uh, has been associated with pregnant women taking acetaminophen. And we also identified a mechanism by which the receptor for folate, which is a, a vitamin B. I'm pausing you right there. And again, they're making reference to paracetamol or acetaminophen. Uh, something we commonly take to reduce a temperature for pain. And they're linking it in terms of a pregnancy. Now, you will notice that he just touched on it and very quickly transitioned to what they think is a great breakthrough in terms of therapy. And you will hear that he focuses more on that rather than the cause, because as I said, I think that this is more political than it is scientific. And so you'll hear this transition into a strategy that they're looking at to help children with autism. Nine uh, was blocked by an autoimmune disease in some kids with autism, and there is a therapy that we're approving in two to three weeks, whereby that pathway can be uh, bypassed and kids can have noticeable clinical improvement, 20 to 50 percent of the time. And so we hope hundreds of thousands of kids will benefit from this new treatment called leucovorin. How rigorous is this research, Martin? And what would you say to people such as Susan, who will very commonly tonight say, oh, if it was this easy, we'd have known about it already? 
Well, remember, for 15 years, the medical establishment said that opioids are not addictive. For 50 years, the medical establishment said saturated fat causes heart disease when no evidence found that to be true. And for 15 plus years, the American Academy of Pediatrics told infants to avoid a touch of peanut butter, thinking it would prevent peanut allergies when in fact it ignited the largest peanut epidemic allergy uh, problem in UK and US history. So we have to be careful when we uh, rely on the group think of the medical establishment. We saw during COVID, they ignored natural immunity, pushed cloth masks on toddlers, and in the U.S. kept schools closed for nearly two years. The, the evidence is... So I'll pause you here because uh, this part of what he said, I think is very important. And I don't think you discount anything, okay? And that's my approach to science. So if there is the potential, if you have not found the specific cause, then why would you take something off the table? You may say, okay, this is lower possibility because of some research, and we'll come to that research in just a few minutes. And you keep everything on the table until you have specifically found the cause. And we saw how groupthink affected in the pandemic. So I don't want to get into groupthink where it's simply, it's impossible. I do think it's possible, although I think it is less likely to be the main cause of autism, unless it is linked to the fact that the fact that the mother in the maternal period of time had a temperature suggests that there was an inflammatory process going on. And whether or not that inflammatory process is the driver rather than the fever or the taking of medication itself is a bit more uh, challenging to clarify. Let's listen to the end part of this pretty substantial. And remember, most low-grade fevers do not need any treatment anyway, even without this concern. A fever may be a body's natural way of ridding an infection. Uh, one research study from Johns Hopkins, my former institution, found that when you treat a fever, you actually prolong the duration of illness in a child. But there were 27 studies recently reviewed in a Harvard Mount Sinai report that was published that pointed to this association, and I'll just read to you the, a quote from the dean of the Harvard School of Public Health, uh, quote, there is a causal relationship between prenatal acetaminophen use and the neurodegenerative disorders of uh, ADHD and autism spectrum disorder. That's enough for me. Shouldn't we play it on the side of safety when it comes to our nation's kids? And we, uh, in the context of an expanding epidemic where we otherwise have no other plausible cause. Reasonable perspective, as I said. And um, it's, it's important to continue to have an open mind and to research these issues. Uh, one of the problems that I think that they'll come up against, and this is now where we link it to some of the research, is that coincidentally, this research came out of Sweden in 2024, looking at acetaminophen use during pregnancy and the risk of autism. And essentially, they were looking specifically at the association with acetaminophen or paracetamol, depending on where you are in the world, risk of autism, attention deficit disorder, and intellectual disability. And they were looking at 2.4 million children between 1995 to 2019 in Sweden, followed up all the way through to December of 2021. So this was a longitudinal, big longitudinal study. And essentially, when they looked at the numbers, they found that the crude absolute risks at 10 years of age for those not exposed versus those exposed to acetaminophen were 1.33 versus 1.53. Now, there is an increase, but they don't think it's statistically relevant. So 1.33 to 1.53 for autism, 2.46 to 2.87 for ADHD, and 0.7 to 0.82 but it does indicate what could be a trajectory in terms of the, uh, the link. So here are a few thoughts, and these are my thoughts. This is my research. This is not um, what you, this is me putting together the research in a similar way to how I approached COVID research, how I approached dementia, looking at things in a in what I call a vectored way and looking for patterns and trying to make sense of them.
So here is a very simple way that I look at the principle with regards to autism, okay? Um, I've used some slides here from BioRender, and um, this is this is what I, I work on, and I'll show you a few simple principles. Here we go. This is an astrocyte, okay? And what you have to notice is all, it's like uh, all these trees, and every one of these and dendrites connect with another neuron. So depending on the neuron, there can be hundreds, thousands of synapses connected between the two of them. And this is a very important part as to how the brain works. And when we look at the kinds of neurons that you have in the brain, this is the kind of thing that you may see. These are all different kinds of neurons. Some are unipolar with the cell body and just one synapse. Some are like a tree. Some are like bushes, multiple little points, and they are all beautifully interconnected. Now, the, the trouble that they have as you grow, as children grow, they then have to do a principle of synaptic pruning. And I liken it to the fact that uh, similar to what you what happens to you if you go out walking around, there are lots of sounds, birds, the grass blowing, a cricket, um, people shouting, a football dropping. But you know, your brain knows how to mask out irrelevant sounds and concentrate on the important sounds, whether or not it's someone speaking. And your brain has to do this all the time. And it's especially important in the young development of a child. And so when we look at uh, uh, what we call a part of a brain here, and this is just showing you all of these synapses, so all of these neurons interconnected in different layers with all these synapses, what happens is that in order for your brain to mature, you actually have to prune these. And we're sometimes talking about up to 40% of these synapses need to be removed so that you can streamline your thinking. And this is what happens with children, synaptic pruning. It is done by the immune system in the brain. And essentially, the fundamentals with regards to autism is that if the synaptic pruning is not done effectively, there are too many synapses that cause a lot of noise in the brain. And those children may have issues with regards to social um, social issues or just sound or light. They are almost oversensitive. And it's because the synaptic pruning hasn't necessarily been done completely. And now this is a very simplistic principle, but it is the fundamental of the condition. On the other side of this, because you have to, there's always two sides. So if you have too much synaptic pruning, that's kind of like when you see patterns with regards to schizophrenia, thought disorders, because there are too few synapses and you don't have the ability to block out and take out certain thoughts. And so you see the two ends of the spectrum. On one side, too little pruning, you can have autistic kinds of patterns with excessive stimulation to the brain. On the other side, when you have too much pruning of these synapses, and just a reminder as to what they look like, you can then have a schizophrenic kind of pattern. And so in children, because of their development, if that process doesn't happen properly, you can then have an autistic kind of situation. Now, it technically is a neuroinflammatory process, except as they said in some children who actually, it's still neuro, um, inflammatory because it's autoimmune taking out this, these folinate receptors. If you have that occurring, you can have some benefit with the Luke Corvin. Uh, but I don't know how long you can use it for. I don't know what the safety is long-term. That's a whole different discussion. But the premise, the simple premise is, and this is my thought now, anything that can activate or change how this synaptic pruning occurs at a certain age in a child could theoretically increase that risk of unmasking autism in a child who has been predisposed maybe genetically 
um, or otherwise because of things in utero, this then can manifest as autism because the synaptic pruning in the brain has not been done effectively. This is going to be very complex. And so labeling just paracetamol is unlikely to answer all of the questions, but it may be a flag to point to neuroinflammation because if a mother had a temperature and she used um, acetaminophen, is it because of the inflammatory process in the mother or is it because of the acetaminophen that causes these changes or these risks to possibly increase slightly in children? Simple premise is, as he said, I think it's reasonable. If someone has a temperature, sometimes the best thing to do, if you are an adult and we are not concerned about febrile seizures in adults, go under the blanket as you feel cold, sweat, drink a lot of fluids, and you'll feel better in the morning. And this may be the approach that they take in terms of mothers being a little bit more cautious with the use of acetaminophen, but I probably don't think it is the end all and be all in terms of the answer. Those are just my thoughts and you can make of it as you will. Thank you for being with me and have a great evening. A hero, an immune adventure. Humming Heroes, your lyrical guide to the body's defenders. Now on Amazon. Check the links below.